Hello everyone, you're listening to the Everything Geek Podcast. I'm your host Jory, and joining me today is a very special guest. We have Alison Johnson, best known for playing Vivian One in Yu-Gi-Oh! Agatha in Pokemon, and additional voices in Chaotic. How are you today? I'm doing well, Rory. How are you doing? I'm very good, thank you. It's a pleasure to have you on the show today. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much for asking. What a what a pleasure on my end as well. Absolutely. So getting right into my questions for you, Alison, first of all, can you tell me how you got into acting? Yeah, you know, it's funny. That's the first question, and it seems so simple, and then I had to think about it um, because I sort of came to it in a, in a roundabout way. I was um, – I'd always – as a as a child in in school, um, I'd always performed. I'd always done theater and um, and mostly musical theater. Uh, my background was more more music than anything else. So when I got to college, I continued to do a lot of music and I did some theater as well. Um, but that was all extracurricular. Um, I, I I was actually a psychology major, and um, and so when I when I graduated from college, uh, I. I pursued my major. I was working as a social worker, and it took a number of years before I uh, I sort of wound my way back to doing something creative. And I ended up working for a television show behind the scenes for a talk show, actually behind the scenes, booking guests and um, and doing research and that sort of thing. And while I was there, the executive producer knew that my background from school um, had been in music and had, that I'd done some acting. And they just asked me to start doing some voiceover for the show. And that's when it sort of clicked. Um, I, I started doing just, you know, little things for them here and there. And I thought, huh, I am much better at doing this, which is not technically my job <laughs> than I am at doing my, my actual job. So when I left when I left that job and that show, I went and started studying specifically with a voice coach, not, um, you know, a lot of people who do the, the kind of voice work that I do are, um, are, are real stage actors and have done that for, you know, for a long time and have had a lot of training as stage actors. Um, I went specifically to a voiceover coach because I, I knew that for me, the, um, the thing that I knew how to do the best was use my voice to tell a story, but I needed to learn how to do it in a way that, I would only be using my voice. And so I started with a coach and then I slowly sort of wound my way into this, starting with commercials and, and corporate videos. Um, and I still do a bunch of corporate stuff and then slowly, um, sort of getting into the, the jobs that required more technical, more, more acting skills. Um, that was a very long winded answer. I will stop doing that. <laughs> no, that was a great answer. So there is, so there is definitely like a preference for you right away that you know, you want knew you wanted to do voice acting, like not really on camera or anything like that. You were like you you were like so focused on doing voice acting in particular. I was, I was, and I don't know how usual that is. I would, I would guess that that's not very usual. I mean, I have so many friends who are actors of different types, you know, uh, stage and on camera, whether it's TV or film. Um, and most people that I know who do voiceover sort of do a combination of those things. So I think, yeah, I think for, you know, for whatever reason, um, I, I, I've, I, I perceive of the world a lot through sound and always have. And so maybe that's that's why. And because I was, you know, I was just I was fortunate to have a lot of musical training growing up. And so I always knew how to use my voice to create sound. So it, it to me, it just seemed like a logical extension sort of of what I of what I already knew that I could do with a little bit of guidance, because <laughs> I definitely had to had to learn some things. And frankly, I had to unlearn some things uh, in order to do voice acting. You think you know how to talk until you go study with a coach. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, well, there is a, you know, job called dialect coaches. So, like, yeah, absolutely. Sometimes, exactly right. Yeah, sometimes you have to learn how to talk in certain ways. Uh-huh. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, and I, actually, I think you're right as well. Like, a lot of the voice actors would also have done stage acting or, like, you know, had other types of acting training as well. Because I know if other Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon cast members I've interviewed, they, like, started out, like, you know, a, you know, regular acting auditions or, like, you know, stage acting a lot of the time and then gradually, like, started booking more voiceover roles over time or becoming best known for those roles, so... Right, yeah. exactly. 
Yeah, so your path was a bit different to the usual kind yeah. of path. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that's the story of my life, Rory. The path that is different. I think you might have just come up with the name of my memoir if I ever write one. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I mean, I want a foreword or at least a mention in that. Absolutely. Memoir. <laughs> <laughs> yes, you will definitely be in that. The uh, the the acknowledgments. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, that's amazing, and I have to say as well, like I've interviewed a few hundred people on the podcast and I think you might be the first or at least the only one that I can think of at the moment that you know also booked guests for something else uh, so oh, that, you know, that's yeah. so interesting I hadn't really thought of that you're right yeah. <laughs> Yeah, that's really interesting to me because obviously with the podcast, I'm the one who schedules all the interviews and reaches out to people. So I think you might be the first person I've interviewed that also used to do that at one point. You're right. And, and you know, now that I'm thinking about it, you know, you, you asked me before we went on the air, you know, are, are these questions still all right? And and it's funny because I, I'm so used to, even though it's been a while, I'm I'm used to being on the other side of that question. I'm I'm familiar with doing pre-interviews with people and making sure that everybody knows, you know, what they're getting into. So so I, I knew exactly what you were asking. You're right. We have a similar a similar background in that regard. Absolutely. So can you tell me how you were originally cast as Vivian One in Yu-Gi-Oh? Uh, yes. At, by that point, I think I had been doing um, primarily commercial voiceover for for several years. Um, and it was, it, you know, it, as these things sometimes go, uh, a friend of mine who worked in, in children's television and then ended up working for the production company that, um, that produced Yu-Gi-Oh!, was I don't know that he himself was doing the casting, but I think he certainly all of the all of the roles that were coming up were were going, you know, sort of across his desk. And at some point, um, he thought, oh, you know, I I know somebody who I think might be good for this. And so he he asked me if he could submit me and and would I be willing to audition for it? And it was um, it was very unlike anything I had done up until that point. And I thought, I don't I'm happy to audition for it. I don't know if I'll be any good at this. You know, it's it, it's funny because when when people hear that you're a voice actor, they often think, um, "Oh, you do a whole lot of different voices." And depending on what what branch of voice acting you're in, some people do more than others. You know, there are some people who do a lot of animation, and that's and they're constantly coming up with with voices. For whatever reason, at least up until that point in my career, I had mostly been cast to sound like myself in commercials. You know, I was always sort of the voice of authority. I was, I was somebody's mother or I was a doctor or a lawyer. Um, and so I wasn't really doing, I certainly wasn't doing real character voices. Um, and and so I just said, okay, well, you know, I'll audition. I'll see what they want me to do. Um, but I know I have to come up with something that doesn't sound like me. And then that was how it started. So I, I don't remember the actual audition, but I remember having to audition and them giving me a little bit of you know, here's who Vivian is, you know, they sort of told me what her character was um, and then kind of left it up to me to, you know, what what would that sound like? <laughs> yeah, that's really interesting. But, and it also makes sense as well, you know, that you were like invited to audition because of course, you know, I've interviewed other Yu-Gi-Oh! or Pokemon cast members and like they're, they'd be they'd be like cast members that you know have voiced multiple characters in one of the shows, whereas you voice one po Yu-Gi-Oh character and one Pokemon character. Right. Yeah. yeah. So, so that actually makes a lot of sense. You know, it's interesting to me, like looking from a certain angle, being like, that's interesting because like a lot of the cast members would like, you know, have multiple characters on their resume, um, and like you have one in both. So that actually makes a lot of sense in that regard. Yeah, yeah, because well, you know, sort of back to back to our acknowledgments, Rory. It's it's the it's the different path, you know. I think uh, in in many, in many aspects of my life, I end up being the one who's you know two steps to the left of everyone else. Like, oh yeah, how did she do that? Oh, that's weird. You know, that's I've never heard that before. So you know, this was a similar a similar situation, and you know, it, and at that point, you know, because this was a number of years ago now, um, I wasn't doing audiobooks yet, so I really. You know, now I, I actually do have to make a lot more character choices. But at that point, I didn't really. You know, it, it just wasn't it wasn't a big part of, of what my career was. Um, but it was very different. And it certainly made me think about how to use my voice to tell a story. In a, You know, I thought having used it, 
you know, for my whole, whole life up until that point that I had an idea of what I could do with it. But Vivian definitely took me a little out of my comfort zone and made me made me really have to think about how to, you know, how to portray someone who is truly just not like me, you know, as you know, her character is just not like me as a person. And what does that sound like? Absolutely. Were you a fan of Yu-Gi-Oh or aware of Yu-Gi-Oh's popularity prior to your casting? Um, I, w I was very much aware of its popularity. Um, I was not a fan, not because I didn't like it, but because I just hadn't really paid that much attention to it prior. So I knew I knew that people loved it. But to be honest with you, I wasn't quite sure what it was. Um, and I think I, you know, I was a little bit older than the average person who was playing Yu-Gi-Oh! So it wasn't like my friends were playing it and I could sort of go, oh, that's what this is. Um, so I, I really learned about Yu-Gi-Oh! as I was doing it. And and then sort of talking to people and and people would say, oh my gosh, Yu-Gi-Oh! Oh, well, you know, blah, blah, blah. And, and so I was learning from people as I was going along. But I did know that it was wildly popular. Yeah. Well, that's still pretty impressive, and, you know, considering, of course, like, you were on the original show after all, so... Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's only become more well-known and more popular in the years since, of course. Um, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> have you ever told anyone you were a character in Yu-Gi-Oh! and did they believe you or not believe you? Was there anyone you knew who was excited for you being in it? That's an interesting question. I don't think anyone's ever asked me, did they believe me? Um, I certainly did tell people I did it. Um, there's a clip of it up on my website, and, and um, I don't know how many people who know me now necessarily go to that that link. But um, but I do remember at the time, I would tell people that I did it, and um, and and certainly I had friends who you know who saw it, who you know saw episodes of it, and and what I mostly remember is people saying, you know. If I close my eyes and I listen, I can sort of tell that your voice is in there, but it sounds so different from you that it's it, it, like, you know, most of my friends who sort of know what I sound like, like, even in voiceover, were like, it's, it really doesn't sound like you. I think, so people, so it's interesting that you should say, did people believe me? I think they believed me because, you know, why would I lie to them? <laughs> but, but you're right. It, it's, it, you know, I think in some ways it, it probably did seem a little bit unbelievable um, but people were very excited and you know I'm really gonna date myself Rory um, mostly at that point I had friends whose kids were excited because that's the age group of the people who were really into Yu-Gi-Oh were not my peers um, they were they were often my my peers kids and they were like oh my gosh my son loves that and I was like thank you for making me feel old <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, well, I mean, if anything will make you feel old, it's the fact that you know you were on the original Yu-Gi-Oh series. Oh, what's well, so true? Because because as I was as I was thinking about doing this interview, um, someone asked me, "Oh, so you know, when did you do it? How long ago?" And I thought, I don't know. I'm I'm not. I mean, I I went and looked back because I I really couldn't remember. I was like, it it was quite a long time ago, and I know there have been many incarnations since, but I think it was 2005, Rory. It was a long time ago. Yeah, that sounds about right. I did. I, I actually, and this is just how much of a geek I am. Like to prepare for this interview, I did rewatch one of your Yu-Gi-Oh episodes and your Pokemon episode, and I remember I, I was even looking for it. I just happened to find like the date of your Pokemon episode, which was like sometime in two thousand and six. So, wow, yeah, yeah. It, it was quite a while ago. It's quite possible your Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon episodes even aired the same year. <laughs> I think I think they might have. I know they were very close together because I remember, you know, I remember going into that studio and and I didn't go into that studio for that long. So I think they were sort of close together. Um, wow, two thousand and six. So here's a, I have a question for you. You, how how are you able to go back and watch all of those episodes? Do you own them all? Uh, well, Netflix has a lot of the original Yu-Gi-Oh! Se uh, uh, Yu -Oh! Okay. seasons. Um, Pokemon has... Uh, Netflix has some of the other seasons. I'd actually find a different website for your for the Pokemon episode you were in. Like, with Netflix, there's, like, the very first seasons and then the most recent seasons. Ah, uh, okay. I have to search elsewhere for the other <laughs> seasons. It's, like, very weird like that, but... <laughs> it's what but you know how to do it, so, yeah. you know. 
Yeah, absolutely. That's, that's cool. <laughs> that's yeah. very cool. Yeah. So, what were you told about Vivian when you were when you were about to record your first scene as her? I think I think what I was told was um, that she was that she was very energetic, but also very ambitious. You know that she was. You know, obviously that's how she got to the you know the master level tournament. Um, and so, so the sort of the character description was, you know. A, she's a young woman who knows what she wants, and so when she's playing the game, it's she's focused. This is what I want. This is how I'm going to play. This is what my cards can do. You know, and blah blah blah. And so there's that that ambition comes through, but that she has this other side of her personality that when she sees Yugi, all of like all reason goes away, and so there's still that driving force that she has to get what she wants, but then it becomes kind of sappy <laughs> sappy and sentimental but with the same energy so you know she she switches so she you know she goes from from very almost aggressive when she's playing to seeing yugi and kind of melting but is equally as um enamored of him as she is of winning so every, you know so it's sort of part and parcel of the same personality but two different sides so that was an interesting thing to play um because you had to, you know, I had to find a way to make her soft enough when she saw Yugi, but still maintain the drive that she, that is always there that makes her want to win. Yeah, absolutely. That makes a lot of sense. And yeah, I mean, Vivian did, you know, have a very interesting, like, uh, crush on Yugi, that's for sure. <laughs> totally, yes. <laughs> Which was really fun. That was very fun to play, actually. <laughs> absolutely. I can imagine so. Um, so what was your experience like playing Agatha in Pokemon, and how did that role come about? Was it similar to how your Yu-Gi-Oh role came about? It was similar only in that I was already there. I was already working for the production company, and so, and there was a lot of overlap, you know, in terms of the the team. So, um, you know, it's funny. I I know you you asked me that question. You know, I, I knew that question was coming, and I I don't have as clear a memory of how Agatha came to be. I mean, I remember them them asking about it. What I what I can't remember is how they knew, you know, because Agatha was the opposite. She was a much older character. So, you know, Vivian was a character who was much younger than I was. Um, and Agatha was a, a character who was significantly older. Um, and I I knew that I could do that. I knew that I could age my voice. I don't remember how they knew that. <laughs> that. Uh, it must have come up. I mean, at some point we must have had a conversation or or they asked, you know, can you you know, can you do this? Because a lot of, you know, if you just listen to the sort of the texture and the timbre of my natural speaking voice, um, and this is, has always been true, even when I was younger, you know, I've always leaned a little on the, uh, it's been a little low, um, a little low and a little raspy. And so it's the kind of voice that, you know, for, I guess for somebody who's casting, if you were casting animation, you would think, um, often you would think either boy, you know, like teenage boy, because often people, you know, women with voices like mine play like like um Bart Simpson, um, or or older. You know, because the you know the the peers that I have who do animation and play girls often have voices that are that naturally sound young. Even their regular speaking voices sound young. So maybe it was that. Maybe it was that in talking to me, they thought, well, I wonder if you know someone with this voice might be able to kind of age it, age it up. Because I don't honestly, I don't know how many. You know, I didn't know their whole cast of, um, of voice actors, but I don't know how many people they had who did older voices because most characters in anime have to sound youthful. So being able to, you know, sort of create, you know, now I have not had the benefit of doing what you did, Rory. I have not heard <laughs> what Agatha sounds like in well over a decade, so I'm not sure. <laughs> I'm not quite sure how successful I was. But what I remember is that it was about it was about aging, you know, aging that voice. Um that one's not, it's not as clear. I didn't do as much with Agatha, so it's not as clear to me. I, I remember I had to work hard to get Vivian's voice because it was, you know, it was very different from mine and she had so much energy. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, of course, as you basically said, like, I mean, it's easy for me to, like, think of Agatha's voice. Like, I rewatched the episode just today, but, like, uh, for you, you know, you voiced her in one episode, like, over a decade ago. Vivian, at least, you voiced it multiple times in right. multiple episodes. It's a bit easier to remember, even if it was a long time ago, yeah. 
the the benefit of hindsight for me and being able to rewatch these episodes. <laughs> yeah, you definitely see you have the advantage. <laughs> Absolutely. What you're making me now I'm thinking, oh now I should go back and try to find Agatha, but it's too late because you've already asked me the question. <laughs> No, your answer was great, so <laughs> no problems at all. So, uh, which character uh, was uh, between Vivian and Agatha was the more challenging to voice, and which did you enjoy voicing more? Uh, I would say Vivian is the answer to both of those questions. Um, uh, she, by far, she was the most challenging, um, not just because of the pitch of her voice, which was absolutely a, a challenge to maintain, not to do. You know, you can there are voices that I can do for short periods of time and they're very, very different from mine. And it, it comes up a lot in audiobooks. Um, but when you have to maintain it for a while, which is true in anime, um, and the, the, um, the rhythm and the energy that go into anime are, are, they're so heightened, you know, it's so different from the way you would speak in any other context, even any other acting context, you know, because everything is kind of like this, you know, everything is very, very you know, plosive. And so to, to maintain that energy at the same time that you're pitching your voice in a different place from where it naturally is requires um, a lot of concentration. And also it's just tiring. I remember I would sometimes finish doing Vivian and, you know, I would, you know, I would walk out of the studio and onto the street in New York City and just think, oh, I don't think I can actually lie down on the sidewalk. That wouldn't be good, but I kind of feel like I want to lie down on the side. I would just be so tired from doing that. Um, whereas Agatha, uh, even though her voice wasn't actually like mine, it's a voice that I can do without um, without straining it, you know, because I can just sort of take the natural rasp of my voice and kind of make it a little bit more like that. And it would, you know, and it that doesn't, for whatever reason, that does not quite require quite as much um, stamina. On, on my end. Um, but Vivian was just fun to do because nobody ever asks me to do stuff like that. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. It does make sense that, you know, it could be a bit tiring as well because, I mean, obviously for some episodes with Vivian, you'd have, like, a lot of dialogue, particularly in, in the episodes where she duels. Like, there was a lot of dialogue, especially in those episodes. Yeah. Well, and the other thing, and I, you know, I hadn't thought about this, uh, Rory, until I started thinking about about today's interview, how much time I spent in the studio, not even doing dialogue, but just vocalizing because so, you know, in the duels, so much of what Vivian is doing isn't actually words. You know, it's a lot of like, uh, uh, you know, there's, there's all of that stuff. That's just like, uh, you know, that you're like winding up to things. And then you're, you know, as you're doing it, she's doing a gesture with her hand, you have to make a sound with your voice. Um, so sometimes you would just spend 15 minutes <laughs> grunting in various <laughs> ways, um, which is a weird sort of tiring thing to do because you don't you don't think about it, but we don't do that <laughs> naturally um, with our voices. So that 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 definitely took some some effort. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, only in voiceover would like that make any sense whatsoever. <laughs> <laughs> That's so true. <laughs> That's true. Yes, I can't even believe I just said I spent 15 minutes grunting. Don't don't ever edit that line out and put it by itself because I will be sent to jail. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll be very careful with editing that. <laughs> they'll be like, she spent 15 minutes grunting. What was she recording? <laughs> yeah, it's like, imagine if someone's like listening to the interview and like, you know, what if they're family members or friends just walks in while they're while someone's listening to the interview <laughs> it's like what, <laughs> what, what things are... i never knew about you <laughs> what, what are you watching <laughs> i think you've got some explaining to do <laughs> <laughs> absolutely i can imagine parents saying that all right or like all their siblings or something <laughs> right mom <laughs> you know what everybody's doing yeah <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Um, so that that was so funny. I just I literally lost track of what we were talking about. <laughs> uh, <laughs> oh, my my job is done. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, what am I still doing here? <laughs> um, so, what are your favorite memories from your time working on Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon? Hmm, that's a good question. I think. You know, in a weird way, my 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 best memories weren't doing the work because the you know the work was the work and it's it's you know it's what I was there to do. I think my my best memories were 
the responses that people had to it. So, you know, you asked earlier, um, did people know that I was doing it? And they did. And and sometimes it would just come up in conversation because, as you said, Yu-Gi-Oh! was very popular. And so sometimes I would be in conversations having nothing to do with voiceover and somebody would mention something about Yu-Gi-Oh! or would talk, you know, be talking about, oh, you know, I... You know, my son was playing, you know, Yu-Gi-Oh! And so it would come up out of context. And if if in those situations I mentioned that I had I had voiced a character on Yu-Gi-Oh! It just, you know, the wild responses, you know, people kind of going, are you kidding? You know, like it was just it was just so much fun to have, you know, have an element of my life that people didn't necessarily think about or didn't know about until I mentioned it and to, to listen to them kind of go, Wow, I I would never have guessed that. You know, what did you do? What was it like? You know, so that was that was kind of fun. To, um, you know, because usually when you're talking about what you do, it like this. You know, you're talking about what you do with people who either are already in the business themselves. You're talking to colleagues, or you're talking to people like you who are interviewing you, or you're talking to people who are hiring you. But all of those people already kind of know what you do to some extent. It was the other people that were that were exciting to me because they would just have no idea until. It came up out of the blue, so that was that was kind of fun. Absolutely, that's fantastic. Uh, what would you say were the biggest challenges you faced while working on Yu-Gi-Oh and Pokemon? Um, I think um, sort of as as I said earlier, I think it was just the stamina. Um, you know, I have different different types of voice acting require different amounts. They require different skill sets, but they also require different amounts of stamina. So. You know, if you're doing a commercial, which is how I started, you know, the longest a commercial is ever going to be is 60 seconds long. So if you're booked for an hour doing a 60 second commercial, you can do that commercial a whole lot of times, <laughs> you know, in an hour. And you might not even use the whole hour. But if you do, you've probably said every line in the commercial that you have to say more ways than anyone can think of to say it. And the exact opposite is true in anime. In anime, you had we would always have a short time to do a lot of material. So there wasn't time to, um, you couldn't overthink it and you weren't going to get a chance to do it over and over and over again. So you really had to kind of go in prepped and ready to get as much as you could get done in that whatever period of time it was. Like, let's say it was an hour, but an hour long, and I don't even remember now if the sessions were an hour long, they probably were an hour. Um, An hour long anime session is like, you know, a 10 hour work day because of the amount of energy that you have to put into speaking at that, in that rhythm. Um, Whereas I could do, say, a corporate job, corporate industrial job, which is, you know, which is very straight, which sounds like me, which is going to be me describing, you know, did you know that the, that there's a material in the windows in your home? You know, it's that kind of stuff. So you're just kind of talking like this. If I did that for an hour, I could do that for two hours. I could do that. I could probably do that for three hours. And yeah, my voice would be tired and and my mouth would be dry, but it wouldn't be like this. When I was done doing Vivian, as I said, I would just think, do I have the energy to get home? <laughs> like, can I just maybe I could just sleep here in the studio because I would just be really tired um, from exerting. So that was that was definitely the biggest challenge. Yeah, absolutely. It makes a lot of sense. Another thing as well that's challenging with animes, which I know from interviewing other anime cast members from Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon, is the lip flaps. Because you are yes. almost, you not only have to record your, you know, lines, you also have to make them, you know, time them correctly with the lip flaps, which I know can also be a challenge. <laughs> Oh, you're right. I, you know, it's funny. I'd, I'd almost forgotten about that. It's yeah, because it's it's the timing, and you know, it's a weird thing because you're you're the lip flap is a certain time, and it was originally recorded in another language. <laughs> so, um, so you're right. It's it's you know, I think that Vivian doing Vivian was the first time I'd ever done a voice job where I got beeped in. You know, where it's like, you know, they use. I'm trying to think where else. Um, the only other times I really use beeping besides anime are um doing looping work you know what looping is um the background audio for television and film um which like, you're usually doing in a group yeah like additional dialogue recording mm-hmm, mm-hmm, exactly um they use beeps as well to beep, especially when you're working with a group of people um and audio description um we use that also when we do audio description for the for the blind and visually impaired that's another place where they beep you in but 
I, but these are things that I've done later in my career. At, at the point when I was doing Yu-Gi-Oh! and Pokemon, I'd never done a job where I got beef. I mean, I'd done jobs that were specifically timed, where I had to do things in, you know, four and a half seconds, but not where I had to, watch, you know, listen to the beep in my headset, make sure that my mouth moved exactly when that character's mouth started, and make sure that my mouth closed right when that character's mouth closed. So you're right, that, that was a that was a challenge. I'd, I'd forgotten about that, Roy. That was a, a very specific challenge. You get used to it after a while, but it's um, it feels very unnatural when you're first doing it. Yeah, I can definitely imagine. Like, th- like that's a special kind of challenge that's, like, primarily with anime voice acting, you know, I've noticed. Yeah. So, yeah. So, yeah. I it's, just... very, it's very precise, yeah. which I like. I mean, I like things that are precise, but it, it's precise in a way that very few things are. <laughs> Absolutely. So, um, as we've touched on briefly earlier, uh, you've worked as an audiobook narrator on a lot of audiobooks in your career. Which were some of your favorite books to record the narration for? Oh, that is, that's always, people always ask that. And, and you would think I'd have an answer if people always ask it. But um, it's such a hard question. It's, you know, I, I would imagine it's, even though I'm not writing the books, I would imagine it's it's like asking a songwriter, like, what's your favorite song? Um you know, it depends on the it depends on when you ask me, and and frequently, things that I've worked on most recently are the things that come to mind. Um, but I would say, in general, I um, I record now. I I do record a lot of nonfiction now as well. Um, I think I prefer recording fiction just because I get to do more with it. There are more characters, and and I get to make bigger choices, um, and. I have ended up for whatever reason, and and it's not so different from anime. I've ended up in my audiobook career voicing a lot of sci-fi and fantasy. And those were not genres of books. I was a huge reader growing up, but those were not genres of books that I read for myself personally. So they weren't necessarily um, things that I sort of walked in going, oh, I love this. But I really love narrating them because if you're narrating sci-fi, it's probably taking it up time at a place, uh, I'm sorry, it's probably taking place at a time that is not now, um, often in the future, um, frequently more and more often dystopian future. And so you aren't sort of hemmed in by the rules that, you know, we know what somebody from, you know, Alabama is supposed to sound like in 2020. But, you know, if some if an author has made up a planet someplace in, you know, a hemisphere that doesn't exist in the real world, I get to do whatever I want with that. Um, so that being said, I think um, I don't know. I, I've um, there's a, a, a Canadian uh, sci-fi fantasy author named uh, Julie. Oh gosh, I want to say Chernada. I don't know if it's Chernada or Zernada. I should because I don't have to say her name that often. Um, but she's written um, a, a series of books called the Clan Chronicles, and I think there are three each section of the clan chronicles is a trilogy so there are i believe three trilogies that i've done now um and i've really enjoyed narrating those because they are sci-fi and fantasy but and maybe it's because she's a female author they're not all it's not all conflict it's not all you know fighting and, and blood and guts i mean there certainly is conflict but it's a good balance between you know relationships and backstory but also you know sentient species that we don't have and so you have to figure out what they sound like um so i i've enjoyed reading that um on the other hand i also um there's a series that i started early in my audiobook career when i was recording a lot of um children's and ya books and there was a series by mildred d taylor about the logan family um which is a a black family in rural mississippi in the depression era and i initially read I don't know, maybe five or five or six of those books very, very early on in my audiobook career. And I was following my protagonist, Cassie Logan. She started out as, I don't know, maybe like a, I don't remember, seven or eight year old. And, and so so as she aged, you know, I aged her voice, but I, you know, I sort of followed the books until she got to be a, a preteen. And then we stopped because that's how many had been written. And then just this past year, I ended up recording a book that that jumped ahead. She took those characters and she wrote about them uh, going through the civil rights era and and a little bit more into modern day. And th- I loved that because these were characters that I had loved but hadn't recorded since mm, you know 2007, 2008. And so I got to do them again as adults, 
um, or I think in the case of her brothers as no, I think everybody, I think all of the kids were adults uh, by now. And, um, and that was just fun. I mean, that was just interesting and felt like, you know, what ends up happening is, you know, for for people that you had to voice for a long time, they start to feel if they're a family, like in this case, it was the Logan family. Well, they start to feel like my family because I have to be all of them. Um, so to come back, it was like I had a family reunion. <laughs> that was what that last book felt like. The, the last book just it just came out. It was called um, All the Days Past, All the Days to Come by Mildred D. Taylor. And um, and it was very much like coming home. I felt like I just had a family reunion with all of these people, but nobody else knows them but me. <laughs> you know, in this room, nobody knows them but me. That's amazing. Um, so which would you say has been the most challenging role in your career so far? It can be a TV show you've worked on, an audio book you've narrated, anything? Oh, I think um, I think pretty much hands down, I'm going to say the Honor Harrington series, um, which is a, a military science fiction series that I have been narrating Oh, I don't know, for 10 years, I think. Um, yeah, I think it has been 10 years, 10 or 11 years. I, I believe I narrated the first, or I narrated the first seven of them all together because they'd already been written. Um, and that was the end of 2008 going into th 2009. And I remember when I first, when I got the first one, and it was called On Basilisk Station. And that combination of I don't you know every probably any voiceover actor you talk to can tell you what their list of words is that cause them trouble <laughs> or that they trip over you know we all have them and I had never had a trouble with that SK combination I actually sort of like it but when you have to say on basilisk station over and over again after a while you can't say it um, so there is that but also um, this particular series my protagonist Honor Harrington is a soprano and the author talks about her being a soprano pretty regularly so that just like with with vivian is a difficult thing for me to maintain um but i have to because she's a soprano but i think that the reason that i would be given a, um, a series like this is because in sci-fi you know often you have a lot of men to narrate and this was no different i would say that david weber maybe in the first book there were you know 70 characters but you know some of the books that i've recorded for that series have been 30 hours 30 recorded hours long and i don't even count how many characters well over 100 characters uh, in a book and so it's sort of like narrating um star wars you know you you have scenes that have five and six people all talking at the same time and you're trying to remember who they are and what accent did you give them and you know what did they sound like and sometimes you have a character in book seven who hasn't shown up since book two and what did that person sound like so it's not just um it's not just a challenge vocally it's a challenge to um to remember it's an organizational challenge i have a huge stack of note cards and, and a whole series of ways that I, I keep myself organized because sometimes there would be, you know, two or three years between books, but I'd still have to remember what a character was supposed to, to sound like and who they were. <laughs> um, and that's when I, th I am so grateful for fans, Rory, because um, fans will, you know, there's a wiki on, on Honor Harrington that I use <laughs> when I'm prepping because sometimes I, I need to quickly figure out who somebody is and it's easier for me to go online and, and, you know, see that somebody has, kept very very detailed notes about all these characters and it allows me to go back and say okay that person was in book three and then i can go back to my notes for book three and find who was the person and what did he or she sound like um also military acronyms i'm used to it now but but um but you know when you're doing space opera there's a lot of just words that that aren't you know sort of in a regular person's vocabulary but i guess that if you were in the navy they would be so you know things like Gra gravitic forces and impeller wedges and, you know, saying sentences that, that include all of those things, but making it sound, you know, your character would know them. So your character would say them very naturally, but I don't always say them very naturally. So, you know, learning to speak in that way that somebody in the military would speak. Um, that's, again, very long winded answer, but that, but that series always comes to mind because it's, it's hard and it's always hard and it always takes me longer to do those books than anything else because there are just so many characters and sometimes just so many characters on a page yeah absolutely that's a great answer and the you made a perfect comparison with star wars because star wars does have a lot of characters right <laughs> right right and you know you don't think about it if you're watching the movie you just think like wow this is so exciting look at all the action there's all these people 
But if you're the audiobook narrator, you have to be all of those people. So <laughs> it's, you know, it's a lot to maintain. Absolutely. And so my final question for you, Alison, do you have any upcoming acting roles or any other projects that you would like to talk about? Um, you know, the thing that, and this, again, like like Yu-Gi-Oh, it's, it's rare at this point in my career because I've been doing this for so long now. Um, oh my goodness, I, you know, for over 20 years, it's rare that something comes along that is that's just different you know that's different from what i've done before because at this point i've you know i've worked in in a lot of different genres um but there is a um a newish multicast um uh i guess it's well it's an it's an alexa role playing game um and so it's it's an ai driven role playing game that that I, that you play by yourself it's a solo game i don't I don't think you're playing with anyone, but it's it's voice based navigation. So you're playing, and you can play it with any, you know, any place. But you can use Alexa because I I asked recently, do you have to have an actual device? And you don't. All you have to do is is download the Alexa app, and you can play this. Um, and so we're recording these characters in the. It's called Starfinder, um, and we're recording characters in the Starfinder game that allow you as the person playing it to interact with us and make choices you know you know i'm not exactly sure how you make choice, but you make choices you know based on questions that you're being asked probably by the narrator um and then you get to be part of the the scene and so um and we've we've just done like, the pilot i think the pilot episode just uh came out a few months ago we just tweaked the the first episode and it's really really fun it's i think the only time in my career when I had to, because I, I auditioned for it, and it's um, it's through Audible, and it's you know so it's people that I know very well, and they, they sent me this audition, and they said, okay, so this character we're having you audition for is um, insectoid, so we need you to um, we need you to make your voice as insect like as possible, <laughs> and I thought, really. <laughs> what does that even mean as insect like as you know because obviously i'm still speaking english <laughs> um so that was you know not unlike vivian it was sort of like that was the direction go ahead sound like an insect <laughs> and i yeah so that was and it was fun and 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 i and i and and, and we just did a we just recorded um parts of, of one of the episodes last week and it's just it's so different from what i normally do um but it's it's a lot of fun. I mean, it makes me want to play the game. <laughs> Absolutely. And if I if my direction so fine. look, yeah. I like play fine, and you'll get it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. If my direction that I was given was literally just send as insect like as possible, my brain would probably explode. I would be like, what, <laughs> what does that even mean? I'd be like, I'd be a, I'd be a, I'd be an absolute mess. I'd be like, what does that even mean? I'd be like, oh, well, I don't well, know that, if I can do that. <laughs> that would be appropriate because if your if your head exploded, that would be sort of insect like. I mean, that, that you'd be very much in character. Yeah, <laughs> you don't have to do anything with your voice. Yeah, yeah. But yeah, you're right. It's it's a weird it's a weird direct direction. And my my, my character is is um her name is is Chizkisk. So um she's got that same ironically, she's got that same um SK combination that my honor Harrington book did, you know, on Basilisk Station. Now I'm now I'm Inspector Chizkisk. Yeah, wow. I'm definitely looking forward to checking this out because I've got to find out what a human insect sounds like. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I, I hope uh, I hope I meet your expectations. I hope you're not disappointed. You know, sometimes the buildup is too much and then you go, oh, that wasn't so insect like, but, <laughs> you know, because you have to you still have to be understandable. You know, it still has to be words. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I'm sure it'll be great. Um, so that's all of my questions for you today, Alison. It's been a pleasure talking to you on the podcast. And you as well. Thank you so much for, for inviting me. It was, it was my pleasure. You're welcome. And hopefully we can talk again sometime. Yes, definitely. Great. So I look forward to talking to you again sometime. Thanks again for joining us today, Alison. Take care. Bye. Bye-bye, Rory. Time to wrap up today's show. Make sure to check out our podcast links. Check out our website, website.fyouthinkgeekpodcast.com slash EGP. 
check out our Facebook page, www.facebook.com slash everythinggeekpodcast. Check out our YouTube channel, www.youtube.com slash user slash everythinggeekcast. Check us out on Twitter, twitter.com slash everythinggeekp. Check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash official everythinggeekpodcast. Email us at the following email, everythinggeekpodcast at gmail.com. Check out my Instagram, www.instagram.com slash Rory Williamson. Check out Alison Johnson's website, alisonsvoice.com. And check out channel 1138 where we broadcast live from, www.channel1138.com. Geek set, everyone. I'm, I, it was having that regular, you know, having a regular series, being able to, she was always very very kind and supportive friend with a little sass. So I, I think it was always fun to play. Uh, I prefer the characters who have a little bit of, of, uh, one of, I know one of my favorite things, uh, of performing the character, especially before I was aware of his backstory. Uh, so I always felt like Marek really took a lot of joy in, uh, in doing the things he did. 